as we'll start. So we're talking today about uh, acetabular positioning and avoiding malposition in total hip replacements. So why do we want to avoid malposition of the acetabular component? Because uh, in the it has short-term and long-term implications due to changed biomechanics of the hip, uh, point loading, uh, for example, if the acetabular component is too uh, abducted or open, which will lead to uh, polyethylene wear, uh, and the extreme of that is uh, instability and dislocation uh, in the longer term. The uh, National Joint Registry uh, from uh, last year shows that the causes of revision total hip replacement uh, are loosening and lysis, uh, which is, accounts for half of them, and then dislocation is 14%. Uh, however, uh, some of these, loosening and lysis, uh, may be as a result of acetabular malposition and uh, polyethylene wear debris. So essentially, what do you want to do? You want to optimize to what do you want to do to optimize your position of the acetabular component? Uh, templating uh, preoperatively uh, is integral to give you an idea about where you're going to place your acetabular component. And even though we're looking at the acetabular component today in isolation, uh, templating will also give you an idea. Of, uh, will tell you where to put your femoral component. Um, the uh, and also, I mean, the acetabular component will also dictate uh, offset and leg length uh, as well. Uh, patient positioning, uh, you know, we most we always use the uh, lateral uh, position uh, with uh, bolsters, which we'll talk about later. Um, the patient habitus and uh, body mass index is important. And McBride and Jenny Flynn and uh, Sean Mackey and Matt Barnes. Uh, had a presentation at last year's AOA regarding this, and we'll talk about that later. And then there are various uh, guides you can use throughout you uh, throughout your procedure to ensure uh, that you've got your acetabulum in the correct position. However, they are dependent on the position that your patient's in uh, and the presumed position of the acetabulum. Which we've got some diagrams down the track. Despite all this, there are still uh, there is still inter and intra surgeon error in positioning the acetabular component. So ideally in our hip replacement we want to restore the center of rotation of the hip, uh, restore the leg length and the offset, and insert well fixed implants with a functional stable range of movement. The safe zone defined by Lewinick is 15 degrees of antiversion, uh, plus or minus 10 degrees, and 40 degrees of abduction or inclination, plus or minus 10 degrees. He showed that in a series of 300 total hip replacements, if you position your acetabulum within 15 degrees of antiversion plus or minus 10 degrees or, and 40 degrees of inclination plus or minus 10 degrees, you'll get a, he had a dislocation rate of 1.5%. Outside these figures was 6.5%. And this is only looking at uh, relatively early dislocation, not the long-term uh, problem of polyethylene wear and uh, long-term dislocation. Uh, Harris in 1980 uh, spoke of uh, aiming for a 30 degrees abduction, so slightly more closed and 20 degrees of antiversion. And then uh, Harkness was sort of similar to uh, Lewinick in that he talked about 45 degrees of abduction plus 15 degrees of antiversion with a safe zone of plus or minus 5 degrees. So some of the guides you can use are uh, you know, using the patient's own anatomy it can be the bony, soft tissue, or combined. Um, so this is the McCollum and Gray technique that utilizes the uh, palpation of the sciatic notch and the anterior superior iliac spine intraoperatively. But you can get an idea of it on a standing lateral radiograph preoperatively with the X-ray tube presented on the greater trochanter, um, and that is usually 20 degrees, and so that gives you 20 degrees of antiversion. Uh, and then in their sort of uh, experience, they then modified that to be plus 10 degrees, so they aimed for an overall antiversion of 30 degrees. The uh, second method uh, is the Soterianos uh, method, who used three points uh, and essentially uh, tried to align your acetabular component within this plane. So they used the lowest point of the 
uh, acetabular sulcus of the ischium. They use the prominence of the superior pubic ramus, and they use the most superior point of the acetabular rim. Now, clearly, some of these will be difficult to define, and they require increased soft tissue dissection. Uh, this is potentially the most confusing one, using the acetabular notch angle um, by uh, Maruyama. Um, it's the angle bisected by a line from the cytic notch, which is here, along the posterior acetabular ridge, um, and then a line from the anterior to the posterior um, acetabular, or acetabular wall. And this line here is just parallel to the original line described, uh, moved posterior. You can see that they're perpendicular. And so they're saying that if you uh, don't have it perpendicular, that you're going to and in this direction, you'll have increased antiversion. Uh, this is what is most commonly used, and it relies on soft tissue landmarks, which are within the acetabulum, so there's minimal extra soft tissue dissection required. Uh, and as we'll see, it is also the uh, one of the most accurate methods. Uh, this uses the transverse acetabular ligament, which is a confluence of the labrum, um, and it was described by Archbold. Uh, here we have a series of uh, sort of computer diagrams that show that here the uh, shell has been inserted to uh, almost superiorly. Here you can see some overhanging uh, rim, but this is actually uh, perfectly positioned. You can see the acetabular component uh, well aligned uh, with the bony wall of the acetabulum. Uh, here it's inserted too deep. Here it's over antiverted. Uh, and here, I think it's too closed. Uh, and uh, Austin and Rothman had some good results uh, trying to define the uh, acetabular component uh, positioning uh, using the acetabular notch and the uh, other bony landmarks of the acetabulum. Uh, in conjunction with the ASIS and the pubic symphysis. So using the pubic symphysis and the ASIS, clearly these uh, chaps were using a supine hardinge approach, uh, so not uh, applicable to many of us. Um, who could uh, not think about joint replacement these days without uh, mentioning navigation is possible. Uh, this is a, a setup, and I've seen one similar to this. You can see there are separate pinholes uh, away from the initial wound. Uh, obviously, you've got a receiving uh, camera or emitting camera. Uh, you've got markers, uh, and these are based on either image based, so they require preoperative CT, uh, or they can be imageless, which is defined by bony landmarks intraoperatively. So what sort of results do we get? McCollum and Gray, that initial one described, uh, they only had six months follow-up in uh, their study, which showed a 1.1% uh, dislocation rate out of five, 441 hips. I would have thought that alone is quite a, a, an acceptable dislocation rate for primary hip replacements. However, it was only six months. That'll give you a good idea about early uh, stability. So Terry Arnos uh, followed them for much longer, over four years, and he had a 0.81% dislocation rate, and still with 617 hip replacements. Archbold had a 0.6% dislocation rate out of 1,000, uh, but only to eight months. But uh, I think this uh, reassures us that uh, the use of the transverse acetabular ligament uh, is uh, valid. Navigation. Uh, there are certainly more recent uh, uh, sort of publications uh, regarding navigation. I know I've seen uh, one uh, when I was at Dandenong. The uh, thought here is that it reduces the intrasurgeon variability. So you get it uh, where you want it to be uh, more uh, frequently. Murphy uh, assessed the accuracy of cup position using computer-assisted navigation, and he found that 97% of his was uh, were in the safe zone, defined by Lewinick, uh, with an extremely low dislocation rate in 462 hip replacements. Uh, Dorr verified the position of 
his acetabular components with, pre, uh, with post-operative CT scan. Um, and he looked at the variability in the antiversion and the inclination. Uh, and the different, uh, so obviously without navigation, there was quite a lot of variability of 11 uh, to 12 degrees. Uh, and then the imageless uh, computer assisted navigation was uh, excellent with only four degrees of uh, variability. Um, and then inexperienced surgeons had the greatest amount of variability, which is uh, understandable. Parat and Argensen, uh, now we get into much smaller studies assessing their acetabular position. So in only 60 uh, total hips, he had uh, 5%. Uh, so essentially three hips were outside the safe zone uh, for computer-assisted uh, navigation. It was, it was more than half with uh, non-navigated. But they, and however, they still had no dislocations despite, um, you know, sort of more than 30 hips being done with no navigation and being outside the safe zone. Caltese, uh, 90 hips. He had three groups, only 30 in each group, but he looked at non-navigation and then different types of uh, computer-assisted navigation. Essentially, computer-assisted navigation had more than 80% within the safe zone. And once again, we've got less than half percent of the, sorry, less than 50% of the non-navigated uh, hip replacements were within the safe zone. Uh, then we had Linders, who assessed the variability of acetabular component placement as well. Uh, but however, this only looked at the abduction angles on a post-operative AP pelvis X-ray. Um, once again, done by three groups, and quite interestingly, there's a non-navigation uh, freehand group. There's a CT-based navigation, and uh, and quite interestingly, uh, there was a freehand, you know, no navigation group who had had previous experience with navigation, and the freehand uh, first group had greater variability, and the others were similar. And their conclusion was that there was a re reduction in outliers which is similar to the use of navigation in total knee replacements. Um, but this reason, uh, I know Mr. Steele at Danny Nong Hospital doing hip replacements actually gets you as a registrar to do a couple of hip replacements using navigation, but you actually don't, you actually use the navigation as a real-time feedback. So you put the trial and the cup in where you think it should go, and then you check the navigation. So that is probably getting to, uh, sort of decrease the variability of, we saw in the previous study, the inexperienced surgeons, and consistent with this group here. So that's a good learning tool. Uh, so then you can uh, combine the anatomical, which is bony and soft tissue, or in this case soft tissue, with navigation. Uh, and they didn't have such good results, uh, but this was only based on plain films as well. Now, what are potential problems of of using some of these methods, um, certainly using the lowest point of the ischial uh, part of the pelvis uh, of the acetabulum. There's all there's additional dissection required. Um, in complex primary cases uh, of previous acetabular or pelvic trauma and uh, dysplastic hips, it may be difficult to define your, uh, especially your transverse acetabular ligament, uh, even though it is important, and your labrum. There may be um, a lot of osteophytes around the rim of the acetabulum that may lead you to malposition your cup if you follow the osteophytes. Um, similarly, uh, with your reaming, um, I think I put that there to mention the osteophytes around the acetabulum. So with computer navigation, um, obviously there's a lot of equipment that's required. A lot, once again, like total needs, it relies on the accuracy that you put in. And that's especially true for imageless. Um, I think it is uh, more time consuming. And you do have the issue of pins, which can include sites. It's got additional soft tissue dissection and soft tissue trauma to put the pins in. And they can loosen intraoperatively, which would, uh, if you didn't realize that, would uh, send your values off. And people worry about the uh, placement of pins uh, in osteoporotic bone as potential stress rises. Other points to note are uh, that I've had one case uh, that uh, I was involved in where the anaesthetic team actually uh, put the patient in reverse Trendelenburg uh, 
uh, while we were scrubbing for the case and that wasn't realised. So the S uh, position was more abducted. Oh no, sorry, it was more um, closed than we would have thought. Um, pelvic stability within the bolsters. Uh, you've got to make sure your pelvis uh, is set up perpendicular to the uh, table and it's well uh, fixed within the anterior and the posterior pelvic bolsters. The patient can move intraoperatively, or the, pelvic, the patient and the pelvis can move intraoperatively, which would set your um, expectations uh, off and your acetabular component won't go where you want it to go. Uh, the incision length, so um, especially in the larger patients, uh, in my experience, especially with the posterior approach, the uh, soft tissues that are distal and in the mid portion of the thigh can make you uh, put your cup into a more open or abducted position uh, and you won't know it. Um, and there are instrument inaccuracies. I wasn't able to find the study, but I know I read at one stage that someone actually did a study where they measured the angles of the uh, intraoperative guides, which you'd expect to be 90 degrees uh, to work out your uh, cup abduction angle, and they're actually 87 degrees. So there is an error built into any uh, sort of guides that you use. Uh, and the old uh, referencing of uh, just make sure your handle for the acetabular component points at the corner of the room. Uh, probably, uh, in general, is not the best idea, but it has, it does run on solid um, ideas, I think, because if you know the pelvis is uh, is square, and if it's a square room, then it probably would end up, or a cubic room, it probably wouldn't end up going to the correct area. But I wouldn't use it. And um, so looking at the BMI of patients, we know that uh, so some of them are very obese. Uh, some surgeons have uh, commented on, and this was also mentioned in... Uh, Jenny Flynn's talk at uh, the AOA last year that, and I know Mr. Stoney at St. Vincent's also mentioned it to me, that when a patient lies in the lateral position, you know, we don't really know uh, if their pelvis is uh, square or if it's, uh, or if it's, because in this case with the more obese patients, the, uh, I think at this stage we think the side we're operating on is actually adducted. Uh, which will affect your component positioning because you're more likely to have an open cup. Uh, and on, similarly with the skinnier patient, you're more likely to have a closed cup. And that was shown in um, the uh, McBride and Flynn and Mackey paper from Tasmania where they looked at uh, 102 hips uh, and after the exclusion criteria they had 90 and they essentially showed that people with a BMI of less than 25 had a statistically significant, uh, were, the results showed a statistical significance that they actually have a more closed cup and that obese patients have a more open cup. Um, and, uh, and this was one of the reasons they postulated why. That's all. Very good.